be sharing with you some details that are expected of you. So it's really important that you take all of this in. Accordingly, if there are any questions you have, we'll be trying to answer those later. But more importantly, your website on the Blue Ridge website has a lot of the details that you may need if you don't catch it all today. All right. As I mentioned earlier, restrooms are about out the back door. A sharp left for the ladies, a sharp right for the gentlemen, and that door will stay open. We will eat lunch in here today, later. It is critical that it not be a mess in here after, so we will be helping each other get all that picked up and taken care of as good stewards of this building. So today we are really, really fortunate to have Dr. Penn Holler with us. His credentials, I believe, are on his slideshow, but he is also one of the online instructors for Blue Ridge. He has blessed us for many years in teaching a course that's basically about the ethics of working in the medical community. That it's very interesting and a very different approach to a, a healthcare course. So if you have any interest in being in that field, I strongly encourage you to take that class your junior year to be able to experience that course. All right, so without further ado, of course, you're expected to be silent during presentation. You certainly may raise your hand to ask questions as Dr. Penhaller allows for that time frame, but we expect your best behavior. And without further ado, please welcome Dr. Penhaller. Well, I, I, don't, <clears throat> I don't mean to contradict, but sometimes I'm going to ask you to holler out things. Um, so, Ben. Please uh, holler, holler out things. Uh, so what I want, want to help you to do is, is uh, think about uh, the ethical implications uh, of technology. Of course, that requires us to think first about what do we even mean when we talk about technology, and uh, what, uh, what does it mean to think ethically about, about anything. So let me ask you first, just to... Uh, Technology is things that don't always work, right? As they're supposed to. There we go. What is take technology? So first, you can talk among yourselves a bit. Uh, name a technology. Uh, Cell phone. What? Car. AI. A pencil. Do you agree? What else? Wheel, a wedge. Yeah, old school, old school, old school. An inclined plane. I once, I'll never forget this as a child. The first time I went to the zoo, I loved the monkeys, and I remember watching a monkey take the food. It was a spinach leaf or something, and and. Hung over, hung over a pipe and was swinging on it. It must have been a pretty strong leaf. And then I, I remember another monkey took the leaf and was using it as a spoon to, uh, I think it was raw eggs they had given him, and was spooning. Uh, and, you know, I, I didn't think then, was that technology? Maybe, yeah, yeah. So what do all those, all those things we named have in common. They don't always work. Come on, Sally. Why is this not going? Well, it already did this once. Now let's try to come up with a definition. What do all those things we named have in common? So take, take a little longer for this. Talk among yourselves. Uh, what, how would you define technology?
Now we've lost it up there. <laughs> So, uh, anybody willing to offer a definition? A definition of technology, yes. Anything that helps you in daily life. My wife helps me in daily life. Is she a technology? No, no. But you're on to something, right? Probably. Yeah. So, louder. A tool to help us do tasks more efficiently. You like that? Mm -hmm. Anybody else? So is there a difference between a tool and a technology? What's the difference between a tool and technology? I mean, you all agree. Pencil is technology so is technology just any tool or what's a, you said a cell phone what's the difference between a pencil and a cell phone well I, I mean in, in terms of what we're wrestling with here what's that you think they're the same no all right let me let me show you what What I have proposed. The practical application of knowledge, especially scientific knowledge, to some specific task or problem, or increasingly sophisticated tools for solving human problems. I, I think what I'm adding here, maybe, to what we've been saying, and what maybe distinguishes between the pencil and, and the cell phone or AI, there's not a lot of science. There's a lot, not a lot of deep knowledge, we might say, associated with the pencil. Whereas as we've moved more and more into a technological age, that has involved applying this very, very deep scientific knowledge we've developed over the last 100 or 200 years uh, to develop increasingly sophisticated tools to help us solve our problems. So cell phone is significantly more sophisticated than a pencil. And AI, uh, I guess we would say, is, is significantly more sophisticated, involves the application of, of deeper uh, uh, scientific knowledge to, to solving our problems even than the cell phone. All right, so we have some idea of what technology is. What is ethics? Oh, nope. Important question. What new technology in your lifetime has most affected your life? What new technology? Cell phone? Laptops? Television? In your lifetime? I think that was here before you, you, you were. Yeah. <laughs> I could say that maybe. I remember the first time I saw color on television. Wow. How is that affecting your life? Yeah. It's gone, but has it affected your life yet? Do you ever use Google Maps? Any kind of maps? Okay. I mean, because it isn't GPS mapping on our phones and cars. Isn't that a, a, a low form of artificial intelligence? I noticed the other day, I had not seen this before. I'm old, so I use Facebook. You all don't use Facebook, right? You do Instagram and TikTok and all that stuff. I saw pop up on Facebook Messenger that I could chat with meta AI. And so, being a philosophy professor, I said, what is the meaning of life, meta? And she said, she, why do we assume it's a she? Um, 
because it's intelligence, right? Um, she said, that is a profound question that has troubled humanity for centuries, and many different methods have, have been employed to try to answer the question, but it ends up being deeply personal. What do you think the meaning of life is? Hmm, pretty smart answer, you know. Really better than I get out of my college students uh, sometimes. Uh, old people, what's been the most transformative technology in your lifetime? Internet? Yeah, yeah. It's hard to remember that cell phones originally weren't connected to the internet. But they're much more useful now. I any other older people? Electric typewriter. <laughs> I mean, for me, yeah, I think it's been definitely the personal computer. Uh, I, 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 you know, uh, as a professor, I write a lot. And it's hard to me to imagine writing, even on an electric typewriter, compared to a to a personal computer. Yeah. All right. So, what is ethics? What does it mean to think ethically about anything? Uh, here's the here's the definition that I use. Ethics is critical and systematic reflection on morality in both its individual and collective aspects. So ethics, we all make moral decisions, or immoral ones, right? Uh, we all make judgments that we would call moral. Uh, my wife told me to cut my phone off. But we're, we're only doing ethics when we step back from those moral decisions uh, and moral judgments we make and think critically and systematically uh, about them. So what's morality? We critically and systematically reflect on morality. I think morality involves judgments of three kinds. I mean, the obvious one, if I ask you all, oh, what's morality? You would talk about right and wrong. Conduct, right? We, we make decisions, we make judgments about specific things that people do and, and say those are either right or wrong. But I would add, we also make judgments not just of the discrete things that people do, we make judgments about people as good or bad. And that's what I'm pointing to with character, right? We have a sense that, that some character traits are what define a good person. Can, can you think of one? What, what do you regard as a very important virtue for anybody who you would call good? Funny? <laughs> you know, it's funny. Aristotle, it's funny. Aristotle was the first person to define the human virtues. He did not include funny. We'll have to, when you ever get in a philosophy class, you should write a paper critical of Aristotle for not including funny uh, as among his virtues. Anybody else? The people you think are good, what, what, what characterizes them? Trustworthiness. Yeah. I think Aristotle did include that. Anything else? Yeah. Good morals. Yeah. But, but that would be trustworthy, wouldn't it? You, you can trust them to do the right thing. Yeah. Reliability. Anybody, just holler them out. Honesty. Their goals. What about their goals? Hold that. That's my next C. Okay. Sympathy, kindness, loyalty. One of my favorite virtues that, um, that, that Aristotle talked about was friendliness. Uh, and maybe that would include being funny. I don't know. Uh, but then I, I always love this because I lear this is the only place I've ever heard this word, but it's a wonderful word, and you all should learn it and use it in sentences. Aristotle believed that every virtue had not one but two vices, uh, one on too far on the one side 
and the other was too far on the other side. So, so like courage. What's the opposite of courage? Cowardly or, or fearful. But Aristotle said there's also a virtue on the, you know, a vice on the other end of that virtue. What would, can a person be too courageous? Hmm. He said foolhardy. All right, with friendly, what's the obvious vice? Unfriendly, mean, standoffish. Can a person be too friendly? Do you have a word for that? Overbearing? Suck up? Well, here was Aristotle's word. Write this down. Use it in a sentence. Impress your parents. Obsequious. I don't know. How do you spell it? O B S E Q. Somebody up? Obsequious. I don't know. Look it up on your way home. You can't have your cell phones out now, right? All right. All right. So we make judgments about conduct, we make judgments about character. But this last one uh, is a little harder to get our head around. I call it conditions, just to keep the C thing going. And what I mean is, what are what are those things that we think make life good? What are the things we value? What are the things we seek through our actions, right, that make our lives better? And what are those things that we try to avoid? So that's why I said hold the goal thing. Yeah, a, 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 a good person is one who has a has has worthy goals, right? That truly are good for them, uh, and and good for good for others. Um, um, so, what's something that makes life good? Health. Better to be healthy than sick. All kinds of health. Mental health. Yeah. Friends. Family. Money. Money. Is money good? What do we use money for? To buy good things, right? <laughs> so it's interesting. Money is a kind of power that can be directed well. We use it to purchase things that really make people's lives better. Or it can be used poorly, right? So thinking about how money relates to, to this is, uh, is really significant. Now, social ethics is critical in systematic reflection on the, uh, on the morality of institutions, uh, the policies and practices of institutions, schools, governments, corporations, labor unions, student organizations, right? Um, so are, those, are their policies and practices right or wrong? Right? I think we would all agree that when the policy of the United States and of its states uh, was to require people of color to sit in a different car, use a different restaurant, we would all agree now that was wrong. That was bad policy. It was morally uh, inappropriate policy. Uh, right now, the United States is seemingly throwing its support unwaveringly behind Israel. And we disagree about whether that's right or wrong, right? But that's clearly a question of social ethics. But then let's think about character and, 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 uh, and conditions here. How does our involvement, our participation in, our interaction with any institution, how does that shape our character? I sometimes hear people say that, that in their work, in, in, the, in the institutions, the corporations, the businesses in which they work, they sort of have to become greedy, self-interested people. Right? So the institution some would say, is shaping their, their character uh, in inappropriate ways. Others might say, no, but my institution has forced me to, uh, for any business to succeed, it has to be good at customer care. And, and uh, so, in fact, my, uh, 
my uh, my uh, involvement in this in this business is requiring me to be a better person uh, than I'm than I'm inclined to be. I, I used to say to people that uh, I was a pastor for a while. That one of the great things about being pastor is I was paid to be nice to people I couldn't stand. I was kind of making a joke. Uh, but in some respects, I knew that my role required me uh, to be sympathetic, uh, not to be too sarcastic uh, with certain people that I really wanted not to be sympathetic to. That, that, that was good. That was good for me. Um, ask ourselves, what are the goods towards which these institutions are directed? Why do we have them? What, what, how do we think they make our lives better? Schools. What are schools for? Education. So we think it's better to be educated. What's the opposite of educated? Uneducated. Ignorant. You know, to tell somebody they're ignorant is not an insult. It just means to say you don't know something that you ought to know. All right? We're all ignorant. And hopefully tomorrow we'll be less ignorant, right? Uh, than, than we are today. So, uh, what is, for what good... Why do we have automakers, Ford and General Motors? Transportation. Why is, what makes transportation good? So we have a desire to be able to move from one place to the other efficiently. And we think that being able to do that makes our lives better. Does it? Kind of? Is there a downside? Well, there's a downside in the sense that they, they pollute. Automobiles pollute. I remember something my father always complained about. He said, your generation has no uh, attachment to family or community. And my response was, you've created, a, well, first you told us to go to college and get educated to better ourselves, and you created a transportation system that enables us to move from one city to the other. And so many people's children were spread out over the world, uh, or over the country at least, but often all over the world, instead of growing up and living and making their careers in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a community in which they were born and raised. Has it made has all that transportation made our lives better? I think overall we would mostly say yes, but recognizing the downsides. Two two other final questions related to social ethics. Once we get to thinking about institutions, uh, we've got to be thinking about power, and, and and because someone controls those institutions, right? someone is able to decide how those institutions, who has access to them, right? Who, which particular goods those institutions are directed toward, what, what particular uh, priority they give to the multiple possibilities that an institution might have. And then that raises the question of justice. So a big question with technology, somebody mentioned electric cars. Can everybody afford an electric car? Electric cars are terribly expensive, right? But isn't that the case with almost any technology? Can everybody afford any old car? <laughs> no. All right. Or uh, what's, the, what's the phrase I remember hearing so much about back during COVID when the, our schools went um, online? Um, uh, what? Yeah, no, but the, uh, the, the concern about unequal access. The digital divide. Was that what we called it? The digital divide. And, it, and it, some people had access to these technologies. Some people 
didn't. And the justice question is, is it fair? You know, who has that access and who doesn't? Um, so all very important questions. So here's the things to ask yourself about any technology. Whoops. What purpose does any particular technology serve? What good does it promote? How does it promise to improve human life? Simple question. What's it for? What's it for really good? How does the use of that tool change us? So, cell phone. And your connection to the internet gives us an ability very quickly to communicate with people who are far away from us. I remember one time seeing a group of my students sitting outside of my class, waiting for class to begin. They were all on their cell phones, texting someone somewhere else. And I remember saying to them, why don't you all talk to each other? <laughs> right? I mean, are we more connected or less connected? because of all this technology that connects us across the globe. And what should we do with our particular technology that we have at our disposal? With almost any technology, uh, right? There, there, are, there are ways to use it rightly and ways to use it wrongly. Uh, did you all see the hearing last week where uh, Senator Graham, I think it was, said that Mark Zuckerberg had blood on his hands because of the children who've been exploited um, through through Facebook. And I remember thinking, what well, do the automakers have blood on their hands? I mean, do we have problems with car accidents? I mean, doesn't any technology? Can it be misused and, and be extremely harmful? Uh, not to get controversial, but what about the gun manufacturers? Do they have blood on their hands? Right? But somebody said, well, wait a minute, it's not their fault if people misuse their guns. And what I was saying, it's not Mark Zuckerberg's fault if people misuse his book, is it? Now, I know it's a more complicated question than that because we know that the algorithms sometimes um, accent the, uh, the harmful things related to, to meta. But my point is that uh, any technology right, can be used uh, rightly or wrongly. So whose interest? These are the social ethical questions I think we could ask about any technology. Whose interest do they serve? The stockholders of the company putting it out, the customers who use it, who, who's interest? What? Who's who's good? Does it promote? Particularly related to access, you know, is it just some particular small group of people who's good it promotes? What is it? How does it affect others? How is it distributed? So I've already sort of gotten into that question. So the power question: Does this technology? increase the power that some people have to exploit others. So we've got injustice already. Does this new technology actually increase the power of those who already have more power than they ought to have over others? Does it increase their power? Are there subversive possibilities? By subversive, I mean, does this technology also maybe create the possibility of those who have less power using it against those who have uh, too much power. So do you remember, um, does the Arab Spring mean anything to you? Uh, what was it, how long ago was that? 10 years ago, eight years ago? There were, there were democratic movements all across uh, the Arab world, human rights movements all across the Arab world, largely fueled by the internet and, and interaction on social media. And, and so what people were saying then was, uh, gosh, here's a subversive use of this technology that is enabling people to connect um, and, uh, 
and, and promote greater justice uh, using, using this tool. Uh, so just uh, 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 another word I want to add to your vocabulary. What was the first one? Obsequious. Now, Luddite. Have you ever heard anybody called a Luddite? Yeah? What's a Luddite? Someone who is violently opposed to technology, or sometimes it's used to just say somebody who's technologically unsophisticated. You know, uh, I, I don't know how to log on to the internet. I'm a Luddite. What that's referring to was is a group of 19th century English textile workers or, or self-employed weavers uh, who protested against the development of mechanical looms, I guess it was, that was going to put them out of work, right? Um, replace them, they feared, um, and 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 you know these were highly skilled people, but it didn't take a whole lot of skill to run these mechanical looms. So they were afraid that they were going to lose their income, lose their life, uh, lose their jobs uh, to uh, to le less skilled, uh, low wage laborers, uh, and they they uh, they actually fomented a, uh, a rebellion uh, that required a, a, um, military suppression. Uh, but, interestingly, all related to technology, right? The emergence of a new technology that these folks saw as an injustice. They said, well, wait a minute. It helped people lower on the income scale than them. Maybe it's a good thing from a social ethical standpoint. You're helping low income people. But if we were going to do that, wouldn't we have some kind of obligation to protect the people that were being hurt? Compensate. Somehow help those folks. All right. So I want us to think about um, self driving cars. Uh, we all agree. This is technology, right? Uh, yeah. This is ever closer to war. Yes. Oh, oh sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. So um, there are there are multiple levels of, of technology involved with self-driving cars. Uh, what's called level one is the car just intervene slightly. So like lane keeping features, have any ever driven a car that has lane keeping features? And when you wander out of the lane, um, it, it, it'll beep or sh some of them make, make your steering wheel vibrate, right? To warn you uh, that you are um, moving out of your lane. Some will actually nudge the steering wheel back a little bit. Uh, but by the way, if you're in a level one uh, vehicle, you can't get in, turn it on, head it towards wherever you're going, and then open up your computer, right? It's, it's just a very minimal uh, sort of uh, uh, driver assistance. Uh, level two features some kind of communication uh, between different, um, different features so that they can act together simultaneously. Um, and an example of that is something I have on my car, adaptive cru cruise control, okay, which sort of combines the, the lane keeping feature with control of speed. Uh, so it used to be when I went down Interstate 64, I didn't use cru con cruise control because cars were darting in and out and I kept having to hit the brakes and I'd have to reset it. But now with adaptive cruise control, if I come up behind a slow moving vehicle, my car slows down automatically, right? And as soon as I move out into the other lane, uh, if I put my signal light on, if I don't put my signal light on, the car gives me a warning that I'm going out of my lane, right? And nudges my steering wheel. But if I put my signal light on and move over into the other lane, um, then my car will speed back up to whatever uh, speed I have given it. That's called level two. Uh, level three 
cars drive themselves under certain limited conditions. So a level three autonomous vehicle will manage speed and steering, negotiate curves, and follow a route. So now we're getting much, much closer to an actual self-driving car, but a level three car um, still requires the driver to be seated in the, <laughs> at the, at the, in the driver's seat and, and ready to take over uh, in case uh, the vehicle errs in some way. Uh, Honda has been leasing level three autonomous vehicles in Japan since 21. Uh, and last year, on the day before I came and made this presentation to last year's group, I learned that uh, Mercedes-Benz, uh, beating Tesla to the punch, was going to have level three cars available in Nevada in 2024. I have not been able to find a follow-up article, you know, whether can you buy a level three Mercedes-Benz in Nevada today? Uh, that was the plan a year ago. Whether that's actually the case, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, level four, the car can drive itself on a fixed loop or known roads. I'm assuming that means if the if the software programming has you know has included you know all the roads in in your in your country's road system, the car can completely operate itself on, as long as you stay on those roads. If you go off road, uh, then you would have to drive it yourself. But this is much closer uh, to to true autonomy because the driver does nothing. Now I have never, is it, is it Waymo? Is that Waymo who has the, um, the automated like taxi cabs, like Ubers? They must be level four. I think you get in a Waymo and the Waymo takes you where you want to go uh, without a driver. Yeah, rideshare vehicles in limited testing somewhere. Um, and then level five would be the highest level. Um, that would mean car can go anywhere, right? Autonomously uh, and obviously no, no driver. Um, um, intervention is required. I guess the difference between level four and level five, here at a level five technology, uh, the car could figure out the road, even whether or not it was in your map system. Uh, so if you uh, wanted to go somewhere that was off-road, the car could figure out how to get there and how to, how to do that. All right? Those are only theoretical at this point. All right, so why are people uh, attracted to uh, autonomous vehicles? Safety. Most auto accidents are caused by driver error. I've seen estimates as high as 90% that fully automated vehicles, all vehicles automated on the road, would reduce traffic accidents by 90%. Uh, and that would produce tremendous cost savings. Uh, primarily, these cars are going to be expensive, so why are they going to be cost savings? Less auto repair to do, and less broken limbs <laughs> to repair, and less concussed heads <laughs> to repair. Healthcare costs, right, would, would reduce the cost. Traffic efficiency, right, we already have artificial intelligence that tells us, oh, there's a traffic jam ahead, uh, let's reroute you this way. But if all the cars are autonomous and they are communicating with each other, uh, those cars will find uh, together right, the most efficient routes uh, to get us from one place to the other. Uh, uh, some people point to accessibility. Elderly and disabled people who can't necessarily drive because of their disability or their age an autonomous vehicle, that won't be an issue, right? 
and uh, then reduce stress on the environment, right? Because as somebody pointed out, they're going to they're, they'll be, they're gonna be electric uh, rather than um, gas, and so that will be a uh, um, help to the environment. So would you agree that, well, first, do you agree that our future is probably going to be autonomous vehicles? Yeah. I mean, I, I keep wondering, will I live to see what they're describing here? Will I ever have an autonomous car? Mm, not so sure about that. But my son, who's 37, <laughs> will he? Yeah, I, I think so. And I have no doubt that you will. Uh, Sally? What would Mark say? How soon? Will we be driving mostly autonomous vehicles? Huh. Uh, Sally's husband, Mark, excuse me, Ms. Outen's husband, Mr. Outen, uh, is, would you say he's a pessimistic character? Yeah, yeah. So he says it won't happen because we won't let it happen. We'll be able to do it. But we won't let it happen. I don't know. We let the atomic bomb happen. <laughs> That's true, thankfully. All right, so what are the concerns? Security issues caused by hacking into the computer systems. Oh my, if nefarious Russian hackers really wanted to mess our lives up <laughs> once our vehicles are autonomous figure out how to hack into those systems and have it have solved playing bumper cars <laughs> right autonomously uh job losses oh can you imagine bus drivers and uh, uh, uh ups drivers and amazon drivers creating a new luddite movement right uh protesting their loss of jobs Obviously, the initial costs are going to be high, which raises questions of access. Uh, who will have access to these autonomous vehicles? On the other hand, isn't there a public interest? Improved traffic flow, improved environmental issues, lowering of costs. Isn't there a public interest in creating provisions to make sure that everybody has access to autonomous vehicles? It won't many of the benefits won't exist unless everybody's autonomous. If some of us are out there in our 2016 Subarus and others are out there in their fully autonomous Mercedes, um, you know, that's, that's not going to enable us to see the full benefits. A machine error. Accidents will still happen. We've said it's a 90% reduction, as some people claim, but they will still happen. How are we going to think about differently, let's say, about if our child is, as a pedestrian, is hit by an autonomous vehicle? How are we going to think differently about that than we would if it was a, a driver? If it was a driver and they were drunk, we, we, you know, we would know there would be legal consequences. Uh, what about an autonomous vehicle? That makes a mistake and kills someone. How, how do we how do we deal with that? And then, yeah, through so the corporation, were they negligent in some way? Did they improperly program their vehicle? But I think part of the issue here is even if we agreed on how they ought to be programmed, there's still going to be some accidents or mistakes. Now, here's the one I, 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 we're going to spend most of our time thinking about, what's called the moral machine dilemma. These machines will not be able to make judgments. <laughs> well, first with AI, they will have to be uh, programmed to make decisions between multiple uh, bad outcomes. Uh, how how will they make those decisions? Can I ask you a question? Yeah. 
question about sure. job losses? Yeah. yeah. So I think this is related to Mr. Alps' concern. Yeah. So do you think there would be a push? This kind of goes from friends to ends, just to the means. Do you think that there could be a push to not let autonomous cars be in effect because of the job loss? Like, would that be a reason sure. for corporations or the people that are making them or whoever because of the amount of people that will lose jobs? Are, are you asking me whether I think we will consider that or whether we should? <laughs> whether we will. What, what do you all think? As we move closer to this technology being practical and being implemented, it will cost certain people their jobs. Will we consider that in deciding how fast to move? And should we consider that? We, we won't, you say, but we should. Why do you say we won't? I mean, won't these people in danger of being uh, losing their jobs, won't they be able to organize like the Luddites did and protest like the Luddites did? And aren't we more democratic now than they were in, what, what century was that, in England? Might they not be able, through the political process, uh, to force us to slow down? She's saying the people that can have those cars won't care. But the political question will be, will they have more power than the workers? So how many votes does a rich person have? <laughs> yeah. I mean, in a perfect world, one worker and one rich person who can buy this car, right, would be equal <laughs> uh, in terms of vote, but not in terms of power and influence. No. Yeah, good, good question. I mean, I, I mean, I think my answer would be, with every technology, it hurt, you know, some people get put out of work because of it. Some people... I've actually heard, I may be conspiracy theory-ish, but I've also heard the same thing about Kim Jong-un. Who does it? We'll never, we'll never really solve, solve it because, because that'll put the... Put out of yeah, huh. Interesting. Yeah, yeah I, I guess my, my ethical answer would be we should surely consider very seriously the people that are harmed by the emergence of a new technology. That shouldn't necessarily keep us from pursuing the new technology if indeed all the things it promises are realistic. We just need to find a way to make sure the people who, 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 who could be hurt um, are, are in some way compensated or something is done to, uh, to make sure they're not hurt uh, too badly. All right. All right. Um, this machine morality issue raises something called the trolley problem. Can we do something to hear that, Sally? This is no, this is a thought experiment first introduced by British philosopher Philip Foote in 1967. You are driving a trolley when the brakes fail. And on the track ahead of you are five workmen that you will run over. Now, you can steer to another track, but on that track is one person you would kill instead of the five. What do you do? Do we know anything about the people? Like, is one of them an ex-boyfriend? Or that 
snooty girl from Rite Aid who was always silently judging my purchases. It's like, yeah, Chicky, a baby roof and birth control. I see the irony. Keep a swipe. And you don't know any of the workers. Okay, well, then that's easy. I switch track. Kill one person instead of five. But this is hard, because the only trolley I've ever been on is James Franco's ironic trolley. It travels backwards from his penguin grotto to his garage of adult tricycles. Um, go one and say five. Good, but there's a lot of other versions of this. Like, what if you knew one of the people? Does that change the equation? Or what if you're not the driver, you're just a bystander? Or let's throw the trolley out altogether. Let's say you're a doctor and you can save five patients, but you have to kill one healthy person and use his organs to do it. But that's not the same thing. Why not? It's still choosing to kill one person to save five, isn't it? Michael, you've been kind of quiet. What do you think about all this? Well, obviously the dilemma is clear. How do you kill all six people? So I would dangle a sharp blade out the window to slice the neck of the guy on the other track as we smoosh our five main guys. Oh, I did the thing again, didn't I? Yep. Ten more, buddy. People good. People Why is that so hard to remember? People... What is it? Good? Good. So this, uh, this trolley problem is, is a, a famous thought experiment. What, what do you all think? You're the conductor of a trolley. It's, it's heading down the road. It's going to kill five. Um, but you could divert it to kill one. Do you do it? Yes. So you decide intentionally to kill this one person over here. Why is that justified? Because you're saving five, right? Would it make a difference if you were a bystander? You're not the conductor, but you're a bystander, and there is a switch in front of you that you could switch. Would that person have the same responsibility as the conductor? What if you did, in fact, know something about these people? And <laughs> the five in front of you were homeless people, and the one was Taylor Swift. All right, all right, all right. Five drug-addled crack addicts, addicts, or your mother. Are you still going to divert to the one? Should you still divert, save the lives of the five crack addled addicts, and kill your mother? All right, another another version of this. Let's 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 in this case go back to anonymous people. We don't know anything about them. The trolley is headed down the track. It's going to hit five people, but you can stop it by throwing a pedestrian. Wait a minute! You said a while ago it's okay to kill one to save five. Is there something different about the fact that this is a pedestrian staying there along the track as opposed to what's different? You're still killing someone. Yes. All right. He, he's, this, this fellow suggests, listen up, this, uh, this fellow suggests that in all these scenarios, you should kill the one as opposed to the five, unless the one is a person of great power. So if it's the president, 
you wouldn't throw... What do you think about that? I heard someone say something over here that I thought was really, really brilliant and at one level, but fairly obvious at another. So you can throw one person in front of the trolley and stop it, should you throw the pedestrian. Do you have an alternative? You could throw yourself. Should you do that? All right, watch this. This is uh, more serious. This is a thought experiment. Let's say at some point in the not-so-distant future, you're barreling down the highway in your self-driving car, and you find yourself boxed in on all sides by other cars. Suddenly, a large, heavy object falls off the truck in front of you. Your car can't stop in time to avoid the collision, so it needs to make a decision. Go straight and hit the object swerve left into an SUV or swerve right into a motorcycle? Should it prioritize your safety by hitting the motorcycle, minimize danger to others by not swerving, even if it means hitting the large object and sacrificing your life, or take the middle ground by hitting the SUV, which has a high passenger safety rating? So what should the self-driving car do? If we were driving that boxed-in car in manual mode, whichever way we'd react would be understood as just that, a reaction, not a deliberate decision. It would be an instinctual panicked move with no forethought or malice. But if a programmer were to instruct the car to make the same move, given conditions it may sense in the future, well, that looks more like premeditated homicide. Now, to be fair, self-driving cars are predicted to dramatically reduce traffic accidents and fatalities by removing human error from the driving equation. Plus, there may be all sorts of other benefits, eased road congestion, decreased harmful emissions, and minimized unproductive and stressful driving time. But accidents can and will still happen, and when they do, their outcomes may be determined months or years in advance by programmers or policymakers, and they'll have some difficult decisions to make. It's tempting to offer up general decision-making principles like minimize harm, but even that quickly leads to morally murky decisions. For example, let's say we have the same initial setup, but now there's a motorcyclist wearing a helmet to your left and another one without a helmet to your right. Which one should your robot car crash into? If you save the biker with the helmet because she's more likely to survive, then aren't you penalizing the responsible motorist? If instead you save the biker without the helmet because he's acting irresponsibly, then you've gone way beyond the initial design principle about minimizing harm, and the robot car is now meeting out street justice. The ethical considerations get more complicated here. In both of our scenarios, the underlying design is functioning as a targeting algorithm of sorts. In other words, it's systematically favoring or discriminating against a certain type of object to crash into. And the owners of the target vehicles will suffer the negative consequences of this algorithm through no fault of their own. Our new technologies are opening up many other novel ethical dilemmas. For instance, if you had to choose between a car that would always save as many lives as possible in an accident, or one that would save you at any cost, which would you buy? What happens if the cars start analyzing and factoring in the passengers of the cars and the particulars of their lives? Could it be the case that a random decision is still better than a predetermined one 
designed to minimize harm? And who should be making all of these decisions anyhow? Programmers? Companies? Governments? Reality may not play out exactly like our thought experiments, but that's not the point. They're designed to isolate and stress test our intuitions on ethics, just like science experiments do for the physical world. Spotting these moral hairpin turns now will help us maneuver the unfamiliar road of technology ethics and allow us to cruise confidently and conscientiously into our brave new future. Uh, so we're running out of time, so let me just end with a, a couple of thoughts here. I, I mean, I hope, I hope you're understanding that uh, moral and ethical deliberation will be required for us to decide how automobiles, self-driving automobiles, should be programmed uh, in relation to the potential harm related to accidents. They will have to decide. The car will be programmed to decide. Are we going to let the car crash into the object in front of it? Front of it, endangering the passengers, the driver, and the passengers in the vehicle, or are we going to have it swerve to the right or left, endangering um, you know the folks to our right or left? And if we got to decide right or left, how are we going to decide right or left? And and is the uh, is the principle going to be well, whichever is most likely to minimize harm? But is harm to everyone counted equally? Or should we prioritize the safety of the driver and, and his or her passengers? Interesting, I had another video that would show you that in surveys, people say they ought to be programmed to count everyone equally, not necessarily to protect the passengers. And the next question was, would you buy a car that was programmed that way? And the answer was no. <laughs> right? I'm only going to buy a car that prioritizes my safety. Now, the other question, big question here, is who should make these decisions? Uh, and I think you know, we have a, 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 a great respect for individual liberty in our country. We might say that the car should be programmed to have various options, and the person who buys the car should get to choose which of those options. We might say, well, the car is a product of the company that manufactures it. They should decide. Of course, they're going to have to respond to, to uh, their customers. So, but they should decide in terms of what they think will sell the most cars. Uh, they should decide. Or we might say that it should be decided by the government uh, through, through Congress and through regulatory agencies. Presumably, in a democratic society, we would all have some kind of input then on how, how these cars are programmed. It would be all, all our collective morality that would make that decision. So I uh, think I've run out of time. Uh, anybody want to have a last thought, a last objection, a last suggestion that would solve all our problems? I, get, I guess I get the last word. Go and live your lives well and thoughtfully, right? And try to think ethically uh, about your own personal decisions, but also about institutions and about technology, right? Thanks.
All right, folks, we are going to move right into your project. Um, we've got a few moments, literally just a couple of moments to switch out the technology. So please just settle again. If you should need to visit the restroom, it's out that door. Uh, we're getting ready to start, literally, so not mass exodus. Folks, hurry back. You're only delaying the pizza. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please sit down, settle down. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated.
All right. Your teachers are going to go through the project with you. What you need to realize and understand is this is a seven county project. So the expectations are literally the same across all. So please listen to each presenter to get the details that you're going to need to be successful. Hey, everybody. I know you just listened and now you're listening again, so I'm so sorry. Uh, my name is Mrs. Carlton. I am a teacher in Orange County. And my objective today is just to start off with you about why we're doing this project. Um, so second semester, we are looking at how to do an engaging, persuasive presentation. Um, you know, you just heard uh, Professor Pinholler talk about ethics, right? And we know uh, the importance of technology and how it's even impacting papers now, right? So uh, most of the assignments that you're going to start to see in classes are going to be presentations. Um, I know for sure, like when we did the research on this, when we started this, how many years ago, Mrs. Carr, did we start this? This is my 24th year. Like 20 years, right? We've been doing persuasive presentations, and I promise you, this is the number one skill that students who graduated years ago will say to me, like, Mrs. Carlton, this is the best thing that, that really helped me in higher learning art jobs. For example, we know that Microsoft will pay you $100,000 more if you can talk to people, right? So the purpose of presentations is to help you with where you're going in your next steps, because there's going to be a lot of presenting, whether it's in three years you're sitting down with a scholarship team with Bill Gates and you want that money for that free school, or if it's for an interview for Harvard, right? Um, so persuasive presentation is uh, going to start off with the research paper, which the teachers will talk to you about. Um, and in that paper, you're going to argue for two sides of an ethical issue that your teachers have already showed you in class, right? Your group assignment and what that ethical uh, issue is in technology. You're going to have to argue in your paper for the pros and cons of that topic. Uh, then you and your team at your school are going to create a presentation together, a persuasive presentation together. And then in April, you're going to present your side whether you've received the cons or the pro side uh, to an audience, to a live audience. All right? And so we'll talk about the paper details now. So um, a big part of research is getting ready to write your paper. And so we talk about the pre-writing. And your teachers have probably already started with you on that. right? You've got your topics. You've gone through your scenarios. And, and the first part of pre-writing is knowing what you're actually looking for. So that's breaking down that scenario, um, brainstorming questions, right? Because research is attempting to answer questions. And so you want to get everything you think you might need. A lot of pre-writing involves just collecting, right? And then you can sort through the information. So you're going to collect information after you've asked those questions. So then you're going to take all that information and then start to sort it and figure out where it goes in this big picture of your research project, of your paper. And so organization is really important because you want to be able to create a complete and cohesive argument for both sides of the issue. And so, you know, to get ready for your presentation, you're going to have a ton of information, but you're not going to use all of it. But keep that pre-writing, keep those resources, right? And when you find cool images, I'm just going to say right now, uh, save them because they will be very helpful later and you won't have to go back and find them. So as you keep your, as you're doing your pre-writing, um, we're going to talk about the sources that you use, but keep a good notes document where you've got a link and the citation. You know what it is because what happens when you come back and that link doesn't work anymore for some reason. So what's the name of the source? Where did you find it? What's the link? And then information on what you might use for it. And so you might drop in some nice quotations that you find, but you want a good summary of the information and anything that you think you might use. And keep that stuff in that document so that you can refer back to it. 
And, and I'll tell you, you know, you're going to be doing in-text citations like last semester. One of the biggest things I see happen with students is that they don't do this. They don't collect that information. And then they're kind of piecing the paper together. And then the teacher says, oh, you're missing citations. And they have no idea where that information came from. And I'm going to tell you, that's not a great place to be because that's stress you don't need, right? You guys have enough stress. You're taking all these honors classes. Maybe you're in activities, sports, plays, clubs, stuff that you do outside of school. Make it easy on yourselves. Organize the information now. Find the stuff now and set it up. Set yourself up for success so that in this pre-writing, you actually can go back to it and you know what you have, OK? OK. Um, hi, guys. I'm Mrs. Johnston from Madison. Um, with a little bit more of the pre-writing, you all are going to have, I think, February 15th is the due date for. Oh, I was just going to talk about annotated bibliography for a second. OK. Um, we have a notes document due in February, February 15th. Um, so the notes document and the annotated bibliography are due. And so I'm guessing that no one has done an annotated bibliography before. But you should spend some time in your classes. Um, each of your teachers will go over how to do an annotated bibliography. Um, but just as a quick general statement, the purpose of an annotated bibliography is so that you can um, keep record of the general gist of a resource that you're looking at, um, how credible was the source, and what's sort of an overview of what type of information is in that resource. So then when you go to write your paper, um, you have that annotated bibliography, which is just sort of a highlight sheet. And it tells you what sources told you what. So then you, you kind of know which source to go to as you're writing your paper. OK, so the paper itself, um, this paper is um, same general length as our first semester project, 1,000 to 1,500 words. Um, you have two due dates. You have a um, first draft due date and a final draft due date. Um, we will provide for you all, as your teachers, a template for an outline. Um, the outline includes um, essentially a minimum of what needs to be in the paper. So you'll see on the outline it calls for two pros and two cons surrounding your topic. Um, think of that as a minimum. When your paper, your final draft is turned in and you find out if you're going to have pro or con for your topic, um, the more pros you have to choose from, for instance, if you've been assigned a pro, the easier it will be for you to put your, the group portion of your project together. So um, the two pros and two cons that show up on your outline template, use that as a minimum and um, maybe go for three pros and three cons just to give you a few more choices as you um, move to the group part of your project. Oh, we do, we're doing due dates too, right? OK. OK, so here are our due dates. Um, there's the February 15th due date for your notes document and your annotated bibliography. What's today's date, you guys? February 6th. So the 15th is not that far away. So this is our kickoff. Um, hopefully, you've talked about your project in all of your classes. but. Um, don't wait on starting your research. The 15th is um, next Thursday. So that's not very far away. So a notes document and your annotated bibliography. We need at least five resources for this paper. Um, the first version of your paper, I would um, consider that more of a rough draft. That's due on March 6th. Make sure you include your in-text citations in that, that draft. Don't wait and try to put them in in your final draft. That doesn't really make any sense. So put those in as you're writing your paper. And then March 22nd is the final version. And then um, probably the day after, Mrs. Elliott, maybe, um, you, that morning, you'll get your, uh, your pro and your con assignment for what you do on the group portion of your assignment. Um, I just wanted to say, when it comes to these deadlines, um, I also know that a lot of uh, really smart kids, as you guys are, are very good at putting things off and sort of throwing it together at that last minute. Um, yeah. So again, that is unneeded stress because these are going to creep up on you very quickly. Um, you're going to do a much better job if you are actually tackling it little by little. Um, that March 6th first version of the research paper, even though it's a rough draft, really try to have the best version you can because what you really want in that, uh, in that time between 
is to be able to go back and look for the little things. Like maybe your teacher said you need some more information in this area, or you need uh, maybe one of your sources isn't as credible as you thought it was. Um, that enables you to kind of go in and really refine it. So the last thing you want is to be trying to uh, recreate your entire paper um, because what you put together wasn't really what it was supposed to be. And I'm going to stress really hard on this one. That scenario is the basis for your paper. Please, 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 you don't want to go to your teacher and say, what scenario? Right? And I've had that happen before. Paper comes in, I'm like, this isn't about the scenario at all. Um, your teachers are going to be working with you on this. Um, you notice that turn it in. Please do not use AI to write your paper because, yeah, honor violations and growth. You want to be able to talk about this. You want to understand it. Just so make sure that it's your work, okay? All right, your presentations on March 22nd, the day that your paper is due. This is when your paper is due. Uh, Ms. Elliott will have um, run through the uh, BRVGS randomizer that will decide whether you're going to be doing pro or con. You do not know whether you're doing pro or con until the day your paper is due. On that day, um, in my classes, what we'll do is we will sit down as groups, and you will go through and decide what are your very best arguments. Okay, because ultimately you're going to be presenting this to a group of fellow students and they're going to be wondering, you know, you want to be able to put forth the strongest case. And again, what are you going to use as sort of the criterion for your arguments? What answers the scenario? Okay, so you're looking what is the best arguments that say that this um, technology absolutely positively needs to happen or there is no way that this technology should happen. And that's going to go out on the 22nd, um, and you begin work on your presentations then. Okay. Um, the lockdowns are April 12th for Green Nelson, April 15th for Google and Louisa, April 16th for Fuliana. What the lockdown means is your presentations will be locked down. You can't make any changes to it. You actually can make changes, but it's not going to show up on the version that is shown on the presentations. Um, and at that point, your slide should be done. Uh, what you guys are going to do is you're going to um, create a slideshow that you guys are going to pre um, present. Um, first part of that slideshow would be you know, a title slide, um, then an introduction, then each student will have their own individual arguments page. So if there's three people in your group, you're going to need three arguments. If there's four people in your group, four, two, two arguments. Okay? You need the very best ones, either pro or con. Okay? Um, and then you will be presenting each individual person can present one slide. So you don't have, you can't present six different arguments as to why something should happen. Yes? Each group has approximately five minutes. Okay. Um, you have five minutes you want to cover as much as possible. Um, we say a minimum. Uh, if you stand up there for 30 seconds, what do you think your grade's going to be? Not very good, okay? Um, if you're up there for 20 minutes, your grade is also not going to be good because it's too much, okay? So you're looking for the best argument. You're looking for um, different um, facts, data that will support that argument. Um, you know, so when you're looking at your arguments, make sure you have something that you can use to support that particular and individual argument. Um, in general, you're looking for about um, one one, one and a half minutes per slide. Um, so, you know, so use it a, as you will. Um, and again, um, for your actual slideshows, um, remember the idea is to have one image that is a strong, compelling image. It can be um, a picture, one of the best presentations ever. Um, I'm sure you remember it. He started a picture of a tomato. That was, that was his whole slide with a picture of a tomato. And he went on to talk about the importance of um, genetically modified um, organisms, you know. And because of this, this is, you know, this is how we get this nice, beautiful tomato. Um, 
that was a, a, a strong image. Um, you can have um, graphs, you can have pie charts. Um, keep in mind, when you're choosing your images, also it needs to be something that people can see. So if you have a graph that has a whole bunch of little lines, and the person sitting in the back is going to be trying to see what it is you're talking about, it's not going to help. Okay, you want things that are strong visual. You want something that has small, or not small, but has large images that um, will kind of illustrate your point. Um, the presentation is you. The presentation is not your slide. The slide helps your presentation. Okay, and this again, this is the skill that we talk about over and over again because you need to be able to um, at some point talk to a college admissions advisor and say, this is why I need to go to your school. This is what I can do for your school. Okay. Um, this is why I should be working for your company. This is why you want me. Right? You want to learn that skill. Um, and this is sort of the first step um, on, on the way there. So your presentations, again, um, are up there. Um, and I know spring break is going to show up in, before them. Um, I will encourage my students to practice their presentations over spring break um, because it, it, the more you practice, the better we go. Um, so present, presentation dates, um, Tuesday, April 16th for Green and Nelson, Gooch and Louisa Madison the 17th, and then Fluvanna and Orange on the 18th. So as Mr. Devine was saying, slide choice is critical. Um, is this a really good visual image? What is the challenge? Too many words. You, the river's distracting from the words. So these are going to be examples of what not to do. And pushing the right button is always good. Mr. Devine's already alluded to this. What's the challenge here? Yeah, it, there are all the things you just said. This is not an image that you wish to use for a presentation. There's so many things you could say, right? You can't read it well. The color's nice. They're different. We'll give it that. But there's just, there's no one visual focus, if you will. How many directions are your eyes popping when you try to look at that? The, the green background, you could debate, but with the other icons on it, it, it's not a good marriage, so to speak. Ms. Alton has spoken. It truly, it, you, you really want to get back to, and I am a recent convert, to either black or white backgrounds. Okay, it, it, it totally focuses you on what's on the slide instead of the background of the slide. So what's wrong with this? I am guilty of this. I, years ago, I thought the prettiest cursive was going to be the greatest font, and you can't read it. And you really have to work hard to read it. The whole idea is that it's captivating and it's quick to understand. So as much as I, I love calligraphy, but you know, don't do all the fancy things when you're trying to put just bullet points, which many of you will be hearing, six words per slide, period. So, so we've got a really good idea what not to do. Do any of you do speech and debate? Then you've seen this before. If you have never done speech and debate, this is not people who have just lost their, their marbles. This is a beautiful practice technique because the wall's not going to react. You can do and say and practice what you want to say, and then your body starts to literally have muscle memory on how to make that presentation. The next thing we would love for you to do is move into doing a presentation for maybe your pet, seriously, or your family, and eventually you will be practicing in your own class in front of your peers. But this, this is a fabulous technique. This is literally a competition. You can see the, the um, citation at the bottom for a, you know, high-level speech competitions. So please consider it. 
They also suggest the mirror. I don't think personally I would that would help me much. But the wall, absolutely. When we're coming to presentation, as Mr. Devine said a few minutes ago, you are the presentation. The slides are a nice little backdrop. And I want you to think about your presentation attire in the same way. The focus when someone looks at the stage and looks at you should be from your neck up, that whole, your face, the, the way you're speaking, all of those things. Everything from your neck down should be sort of boring. It shouldn't be distracting from all the amazing things that you need to say. Okay? So just take a look, take a read. That's what your expectations will be for presentations. If you, for whatever reason, can't make that happen, let your teacher know. We will work with that scenario, get you what you need. Not a problem. Not a problem at all. But do know that after you graduate from high school, there will be quote unquote dress code expectations wherever you go next. Okay? If it, do any of you work right now? Can you roll up and work just wearing whatever most of the time? Depends on where you work, but many jobs, there's going to be an expectation. So this is just sort of thinking down the road type of thing. What you may not be aware of is that we have a whole separate curriculum, separate from your world history, from the biology you'll take next year, from your senior capstone and all the things, and you can read them behind me. All of the little things that we make you do are to work on these skills. I want to highlight one in particular today, and that's the communication skill. First time you're going to be working really in a presentation team, and it is going to be really critical that you communicate. You won't be working across counties, but you'll be working with peers in your own classroom. So you're going to have to make sure that you're talking about the expectations of your presentation, that you are learning how to disagree, because that's a lost art, that you are figuring out there's not a group contract for this project, but there will be one in the future. And we have these types of things in place to help you work on these skills. And communication is almost always the first step to any of those challenges. So please be sure that if you have an expectation that I'm supposed to do this for the group slide and I haven't done it, how are you gonna handle that moment? You've gotta start figuring about how to communicate those things to each other. And then later next year, across county lines to the other divisions that you'll be working with, these are the skills that we don't talk about so much, but this is the why for many of the things we ask you to do. So please keep that in mind when it feels like we're just trying to be annoying. We're really working on a bigger picture here. Hey, how y'all doing? Very good? Who's hungry? <laughs> All right, so I'm Ms. Carr. I'm from Louisa County Public Schools. Go Lions. Um, I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about uh, evaluating your websites. And what I want to make sure that you all know is that not everything on the Internet is true. I, I know you all probably think it is, but it's really not. not all, it's not all true. So with that being in mind, we're going to talk about bias and credibility. All right, what's bias? Who can give me a definition? What is it? Okay, because of how you feel, preferring want something one over something else. Okay, good. So, all sources pretty much have some bias, believe it or not. It is hard for people, well, maybe AI sources don't because they're not human. So, bias, the true definition is, wait, go back, go back, see? Uh, a preference or an inclination, especially one that inhibits impartial judgment. You're going to find sites that have bias. And bias isn't always a bad thing. You just have to make sure that you're aware of the bias and that you take that into consideration. All right. Oh, we can skip this. We can let's, let's skip it. Some of the things that you can look at to find out uh, if, if a source has bias or not are things like figuring out the author's purpose. Is the website that you're looking at, is the whole point of that website to persuade you to do something or to buy something? Would that be a good thing? No. 
Uh, what's the author's purpose? Is it to inform? Is it to entertain you? Or is it to sell you something? So of those letters, which one is going to be the best one for you to go for? Good job. Y'all must be in governor school or something. Gosh. All right. So let me do a little exercise here with you on bias. Is anybody in here familiar with the Boston Massacre? All right. So when did y'all learn that? Like seventh grade? Okay. I'm going to show you two different pictures. Okay. All right. This is the first one. This is not one that you've probably seen before. But who does it look like? Well, first of all, in the Boston Massacre, there were two sides, right? Colonists and the British. Can you tell in this picture who the artist is kind of trying to blame here? All right, so, so it looks kind of dramatic, but what's your name? Weston just said you can't really tell. This just, like, just looks like a big brawl in the middle of the street, right? Do both sides have some sort of weapon? Yes, and we know that the ones on the left, the British, are the ones who have the better weapons, but it just looks like a big fight. Now, this is the one that you're probably most familiar with. Okay. Does anybody know the author of this? I mean, the, the, the creator of this? Anybody know? Come on. This is what? Paul Revere. Ding, 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 ding. Paul Revere got it. Correct. Now, this was deemed the bloody massacre. What is the difference in this picture compared to the previous one? What? It's pr this picture, this people said over here, this picture is trying to blame the redcoats for sure. It's these the people on the le on the right most definitely look like the they're the antagonist of the group. Uh, does this one show the colonists having very many weapons, if at all? No. So this. The, the purpose of this painting would be to persuade you, correct? So if, you are a, if you're one of those people who are on the fence in terms of figuring out whether we want independence or not, this might help you get off the fence and go to the side of, yeah, we need to separate. So at, in all actuality, this is actually more, more like what really happened. All right. Come on, that clicker. One more. All right, questions to consider. Is the information presented in a fair, objective manner? Not in that. Wait, Mom. Has some of the information, this is just like if you're analyzing a source in general, like a website. Can facts be verified with another source? Cross referencing, that's very, very important. What is the tone or of the language used, and is it free of emotion arousing words? Bloody massacre. Is there anything emotionally arousing about that? Absolutely. Are there pictures and words that arouse them? This is if you're doing websites. Hold on now. Is the appearance of website appealing and colorful with lots of graphics, animation, celebrities trying to grab your attention? That would be a bad thing. Does the website contain advertising? These are all things that, if when you're looking at websites, because most of you are going to use websites or things on the internet to find your find your sources, your resources for this for this paper, you want to try to find website sources that are going to be free of these things because generally speaking if it's got these things on it it's trying to do something other than to just inform you about something all right credibility real quick you can kind of tell from the beginning when you look at your the, your, the web address uh, if it's a dot com that's commerce so automatically what's, what's that mean they're trying to sell you something more than likely or dot uh, org is a nonprofit organization Net, network, EDU, education, and GOV's government. All right, positives of credibility checklist. Authors identified. Uh, how long has it been since the website's been updated? If it was updated in 2002, then it's not very good. It's the same thing I told my kids about if you were doing research on cell phones and you had data from 2002 about cell phone use, is that going to be good data? No, because it's too old. I mean, think about the difference between how many people use cell phones in 2022 than 2023. Negatives. It, does the website look basic? Uh, how many of you have heard of Mr. Don's world history class? Okay, so Mr. Don, Mr. Don, I am sure he's a great teacher, but you should not be using Mr. Don for any kind of research that you're doing for this class because he probably teaches at a middle school and so his information on his website is basically middle school-ish. Okay, oh, I, these are fun. Okay. 
All right. So listen, this, this, listen up. Can I click these? So these are websites that are supposed to be, listen up. Lunch is waiting. I bet they have that pizza out there. So these are websites. My whole point to putting these websites up here is to show you that just because something looks pretty. What? Oh, okay. Just because something looks pretty and looks professional doesn't mean that it's reliable or credible. For example, has anybody ever seen Ninja Burger? I just found Ninja Burger. Looks good, right? A single four ounce patty hand broiled over the finest free range artisanal charcoal briquettes comes with secret sauce, lettuce, blah, 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 kung fu grip. Four ounce all beef patty cooked over the open flame fueled by the bones of our enemies. Ninja fries, a standard ninja portion of hot, crispy French fries cooked in rendered fat of our enemies. Comes with your choice of dipping sauce, blah, blah, blah. So once again, this, this looks like a legit website, but clearly it is not. That's true. The pricing is all, all automatically fake. All right. Now, I've used this next one for uh, almost every year. All right, does anybody know about Dog Island? So, listen, I have a dog, Winnie. And if Winnie could go to Dog Island, I would send her there for vacation because Dog Island is, is a vacation spot for dogs, and clearly this is fictional as well. Does anyone know what... Uh, Dihydrogen monoxide is it's water. So this is all about why water is bad and all the problems with water. What is the link between dihydrogen uh, di monoxide and gun violence? Water. Correct. All right, last one. I guess this is what got the audience's... Uh, <laughs> I had to end with the best one, right? I had to end with the best one. So, this again looks like a legitimate site. It's not trying to sell you anything that I can tell. Shh, listen up. It's not really trying to sell you anything, but once again, these, these are just sites. Some of these sites, uh, my kids did one on uh, Explorers and uh, where they learned that Christopher Columbus was born in 19, what was it? 06 and died in anyway all the information was false but these are just sites i just wanted to show you these just so you would know that just because it's on the internet and it looks good and it looks professional doesn't mean that it's going to be have good information that you should use uh, one last thing before this out comes up i think she's going to get into this but i'm going to i'm going to be her lead in it is very, very, very important. Your opinion about something or the claim that you're going to make about the pros and cons of your topic are only as good as the information you use to support them. That's your evidence. And in this case, your evidence needs to be more than a generalization. It needs to be more than just um, uh, water is bad because it produces um, testosterone and makes people mean. That's a generalization. Some of these things, if we're doing a generalization, might be true. If we're talking guns, guns lead to violence. Is that true? But that's not as good as you giving statistics to prove that point to be true. Same thing with cell phones. Cell phones, uh, texting increases uh, car accidents. Is that true? We would all probably agree that that's true. But the way you, the way you solidify that and make your argument better is by offering statistics. And that's a great lead in because she's going to talk to you about where you find your statistics. All right. So what type of sources are you supposed to use for this? Scholarly. All right. So luckily for you, you're all in Blue Ridge. 
And I have made a whole web page that gives you access to databases. Um, so there's a couple on here that I want you guys to know about. The first is the EBSCO database. This is probably the largest. Um, your school library does not have access to this, so you really have to follow these directions for how to log into it. Um, but it's going to be full of scholarly, peer-reviewed article and journal entries. Um, additionally, we have this points of view database login. Um, this one is a really interesting database because when you search a topic, it gives you point counterpoint articles, which is kind of like pro and con. So this is the best place to start with your topic to kind of get a general overview of what the main pro con arguments might be for a topic. And then it'll give you the terms and things to look deeper into your subject. And then lastly is the JSTOR, which your school library probably does have access to with your Blue Ridge account. Um, I think you can, yeah, you can read 100 articles a month, but with your school login, um, you can probably read an infinite amount and be able to download them. Um, but because we don't have a building, they won't give us full access to it. Um, so those are the main places that you can check out. So EBSCO, Points of View, and JSTOR. If you come across an article that you don't have access to, because it's like behind a paywall or something, what should you do? You should just give up. Kidding, kidding. Um, just email me the citation for it. Um, I have access to much larger databases than you guys do, and I have a uh, collegiate level library contacts and a lot of times I can contact them with hey I have a student that needs access to this article and their turnaround time is like sometimes immediately but sometimes up to 24 hours but they have gotten me very obscure articles that we could not find any other way and don't ever pay for an article send me the citation and I will send it back for you I know Louisa's 10th grade I think I've sent them like 14 just since the Arabidopsis project started because um, they couldn't get access to them. So definitely, you know, the internet, Wikipedia, that's a great place to kind of do the initial levels of your research, but don't expect to use all of those for your paper and for your arguments. You're really going to want higher level journal and periodical articles um, for your data and your sources. Wikipedia is great for getting a background set of knowledge on a topic. But the most powerful part of Wikipedia is all the really tiny little links at the bottom of the page, which are what? Their sources. Go to the original source and check that. Um, so Wikipedia is not a bad thing. It's a great place to start. You just can't cite it you would want to find the actual source that they used and confirm that it's accurate and cite that. We strongly encourage you dive into the databases now. That will make sophomore year and senior year so much easier. So get into it now, then you'll know where it is and you'll know how to go through the process. First semester project, the databases might not have been as helpful to you, but you're dealing with more current events now, so the databases really should be of a bigger help to you than they were with your first semester project. So I'm just telling you, don't like discount it just because you weren't able to find anything last semester. That's critical. Thank you, ma'am. All right, I know that you are totally information overload at this point, so we're gonna feed you, but you need to listen to the directions. Everybody will look at the back doors that way. The single door that's open is the go into door. The double doors will be the come back out of the lobby, all right? We are going to do it by county just for the sake of organization. Again, you may, you may eat anywhere on this level. You may not go up into the back balconies. You may not go onto the stage. And please make sure there are no crumbs, no 